Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. We have Lexi Gross and Lisa McInter from Business Valuation Resources. And as the sales and marketing team leadership over there, they will be discussing how they have leveraged Salesforce.com to create a high-performing sales culture and a <laughs> atmosphere of excellence at their company. So now I'm going to turn it over to Lexi. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I'm going to see if this works. Yay. Um, I wanted to first go around the room. Thank you for your interest for being here. I wanted to see and sort of take a poll on who already has implemented a CRM, whether Salesforce or not, and sort of within the last year. Who's done it in last two to five years? Who's had it for as long as 1997 when Salesforce came around? Not yet. But <laughs> almost, <laughs> up until then. All right, great. So almost everyone here has it. That's fantastic. Um, except, except, uh, except for you. That almost you everyone here. collections of cocktail oh. <laughs> That's effective. <laughs> well, um, we're, you know, this, I want to make sure that we're talking to all of your interests here. So... Feel free to jump in, ask any questions. Uh, we were going to go through the idea of the process and how we got to where we were. Quick sort of story on how we even got here. We implemented Salesforce within the last year. I, I however, have been working with Salesforce since early 2000. And um, when I joined BVR, that was one thing that not only was fed back to me from my sales team, I'm the VP of sales, sales um, but it was also, you know, something that we could see that had to do with the broader vision of where we wanted to go. And one major, major step in this process was to really understand what your customer was. So this is where your CRM strategy is. I'm just going to give it a little bit of background. And again, sorry if I'm being remedial here. Um, the most important thing about your customer is, in the end today, you're going to get a 360 degree view of your customer. And you need to have that in order to succeed in any type of marketing that you're going to do. Um, your CRM isn't a CRM unless it affects the whole customer experience. It's a strategy. It's not a project. And that's really, really important. It also must prove ROI. My boss is sitting right there. She certainly was not going to invest unless I proved some ROI right there. And, you know, it's, it means the technology, but it's certainly not the end. Because Salesforce may be a great technology, but it's the people behind it who will actually make it effective. Um, any questions? So, I figured this was the last slide and we moved it to the beginning. <laughs> Might as well just start right off with what we learned. So. Easy steps to a successful integration. Um, and I will say that we did our integration within about, within eight to 12 weeks after the whole entire research process. Most important, you gotta get senior management buy-in right from the get-go. Everyone has to be on board or it will not succeed with any project, but especially with a technology project where it's gonna be some type of cultural change which eventually happens. Um, which leads right into number two, that the CRM is actually a change in your culture and it, in your process, and it's not just an automation of your existing processes. A CRM, I used to be in the web world before I came into publishing, and I would always say to my clients when I'd go work with them, when we start redesigning your website, we are going to uncover operational questions that you would have not even thought of. And it's the exact same thing with the CRM. You're going to uncover things that you haven't even thought were actually perhaps a blocker, et cetera. So again, it's a change in your culture and in your existing current processes. Don't evaluate your CRM as in a vacuum, just by yourself. Initially, Lisa and I, it's a direct, you know, marketing sales hand in hand, we had done a lot of research by ourselves, but once we felt prepared enough, we tried, we tried to bring in everyone that would have any type of, um, be affected in any way by the uh, CRM. Very important, right here in the middle, you gotta keep it simple. The more complex it is, the more stressed out everyone will get. Keep it simple, very small, achievable goals, 
early on to achieve wins so that you're not completely frustrated by the time you're in week three or four of the implementation. Number five, which probably should be number one because I keep talking about this all the time, hire a professional integrator. Use, you know, probably between 10 to 20,000 bucks. That will be worth it in the end. That will streamline your processes. You will get there quicker. These people have been working with the, whatever CRM it is in our case, Salesforce, from the beginning, they will give us best practices, they will be able to program quickly. You don't want to take away from your existing IT resources. That will probably be your biggest number one mistake because you will be, you will certainly not be able to achieve it within the quick timeline that you want to get to. Um, set also milestones. I, I talked about this a lot. People like goals. People like to achieve their goals. Make them small, make them simple, make them achievable, and hit those milestones and celebrate those successes. Train, 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 train. Can't say that enough. Train, train. Get everyone involved. Have them be training. When you have a professional integrator, they will actually help the training, help train your team. Um, this is going to sound sort of funny. Do the IT part last. Don't worry about the IT. This is a tool. You're not going to be a programmer. You're not going to be doing C++ or anything like that. Don't worry about the IT part. That will take care of itself. What you need to worry about is your processes, the buy-in, um, keeping it simple, etc. Questions? On to the next. Back to my point about hiring an integrator. For the very simple reason is that they can do it better than you can. It will help you achieve faster ROI because your technical setup and your data import will run as smooth as possible. Um, I have a colleague here, Jacob Perry. He was he and I are both in on sales team, Salesforce team. I'm sure you can attest to that. Getting the data import with our integrator would have been much simpler and was much simpler and easier than doing it ourselves. You apply the best industry practices when you work with people who do this all the time. You. You know, it'll customize to, they know how to customize it to what your business needs and all processes are. Very important, when you have the integrator, it goes so smoothly that you can actually create an immediate win for your, whoever you're trying to get on, whether it's a sales force, a customer service, because you will have the training, it will be almost a se seamless integration, and you will have adoption rate. You will see that people will actually want to adopt quick. Um, training program, always, very important, try to train, follow up train, and again, when you have an integrator, they will apply the best practices there. Any comments? I think, you know, I, one of the things I think when we were going through the planning was definitely it, it caused us, again, to look at our current processes and how we were doing things and then revisit those. And then, too, when we were thinking, oh, we knew how we wanted it mapped out, our integrator would be like, mm, I don't think you, you know, definitely pointed out some potential pitfalls if we would have gone down that path. So. Yeah, and making a mistake that would cost us time when we didn't really have. You know, time is a very, very, very important commodity, and that was one thing we didn't want to lose here. Any questions about the integrator? Um, I just wanted to go through the phases because I, I found, you know, in past talks about Salesforce, um, people really want to know how we did it. So if this is too much, we don't have to go through it, but I want to make sure that I'm answering some of the questions. Go ahead. Just for some context, can yes. you explain sort of the configuration? You say Salesforce integration, but what was it integrated to? And can you just talk a little Sure. Just context of how it's used. OK, so we have, we have actually a couple different technical systems. <laughs> a couple. Well, let me simplify. We do have a couple of systems including we provide um, online resources too. So we have a, a back end which lets folks get into the database. We also use um, a system called Multipub for a fulfillment system, which was very important because that's where our cash and our orders are and our historical data. So that was part of the integrating. Um, and that was pretty much. So what's the flow? So it's, it's, for, it's for tracking leads, right? And then going through. Not only, Salesforce, is, Salesforce has actually two components to it. It has the leads, which is your new business, 
but it also has, your, as they call them, your contacts and your accounts, which are your existing accounts. Sure. Those two are actually sort of separated by a wall, so they're, they're two different ways you're gonna treat those folks. Sure. Um, our leads are very different than what our contacts are. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and I think before we didn't really have a system, like it almost had, you know, so if we had salespeople wanted to be able to make notes, yes, you can make notes, but they weren't easily searchable. Not everybody was used to actually using multi-touch, but they wanted to get a view of what was going on with the customer. So it was kind of like sharing the customer intelligence more widely across the, the company. Um, we didn't have a good way to do that. And we, you know, we were just parsing lists, pulling them out and using them in this Oh, the Excel pipelines that my team had? Frightening. <laughs> do your multi-hub and Salesforce systems talk to you? They do right now. We're um, And actually, Lorna, thank you for being here because you can save me some of these questions. We're um, in the beginning, right now we're having, and Jacob probably can explain this a little bit better, but we're having almost a one-way dialogue. What we do, well, what we do right now, well, it's, it's twofold. So we actually can have, if it's a contact and it's an existing customer and it has a multi number, we have put in a little module where we can actually see the history through multi -pub. That's one point. But the second point to my job and role is to create new business is with the leads. So then we have leads that we put in that may not be anywhere in our marketing system or anywhere in our marketing file. Those. We then actually, it's the onus is upon the salesperson or whoever's working to press a little box that says bring into multipub. And that goes on a weekly multipub swap where we swap out the data that has the new person and it flows into Salesforce. That also, though, um, has also anything if we affect certain fields, if we change an address, change the nickname. You know, change the telephone number, email, that also flows into multi-pub. So what we're trying to do is actually make Salesforce the first place where, the only place where customer service and sales update any demographic information. So your leads go into multi-pub? Once we have said we've qualified them, or not qualified, once we feel that they are ready to go into our marketing file and get onto our distribution, then we can check the so box. These are like trials. No, once they don't they, become a trial. So they, once they get into multi-pub, they are in, they're starting to get publications from you. Right now, we still leave. Right now, yeah, yes. leads um, are in Salesforce. Uh, we gather a new name. We want the salesperson to qualify. We don't want to automatically put them on marketing lists. Um, so once they determine that yes, they should go on, they kind of give us. Um, we have some fields to help designate which of our marketing lists they should go on. Right then, they go into multi-pub. Because right now, we're using. Vision is that we're moving towards with some new things around the corner is that we will use um, through Salesforce our contact leads and, and we'll do some marketing automation there. And so that will be kind of our, our home base there rather than going back and forth. Bobby. So what defines what shifts from a lead to a contact or to an account for you? What do you use to qualify that change? Because that's if they're ready to spend money with us. If they're ready to spend money. Then they are still quali a qualified lead. And then once they spend money with you in their account? They would become an account. Okay. Generally. Rule of thumb, generally. There right. are certain right. exceptions. Someone I know is part of my biggest client and he's new or she's new at the firm. I will then say, oh, you came in as lead. You actually belong with Ernst & Young Singapore. I'm going to add you to that account. So it's really, it's, 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 it's also a feel upon the salesperson, right. okay. as you know well, he's better. Okay. Anyone else? Kim, your table's so quiet. Busy getting all sorts. Okay. So um, I'm just going to go through this. You guys can read it yourself. I'm happy to send you the, the PowerPoint, too. But we went through, the first phase was sort of the winter 2013. We did our CRM assessment. You know, we did this a lot of Lisa and I developing a preliminary project plan, um, interviewing our key department managers to see how, how it would affect them. If, you know, maybe we were excited about it. Really, actually trying to create the buzz. 
get them excited, not asking them if they're excited to get it. Yes, Bill. Part of the reason for the uh, the lack of rules on the part of the is uh, we actually went, we did two sales force implementations. Okay, yeah. The first one we thought we were really smart and did it really well. And we had done an excellent job of uh, creating um, a little more expensive electronic roller decks than we had previously. And then we brought in somebody um, who actually You brought in somebody as in a salesperson or someone, an integrator? We brought somebody as, an, as a sales manager who actually had been doing sales force integration. Okay, yeah, who, sure. who knew what its capability was for. And, and then we changed the whole instance of it. And, and we actually even ended up with a really, really good system. But, but we probably missed two. You did it in-house. We did it in-house. We thought we were smart. We might have been smart to do it here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, I think I think something like this also. Uh, one of one of my um, one of my sales guys who just bought his first house. And he's like, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do all the floors by myself, and I can do this. And sure enough, you know, three weeks later, he's like, I'm still doing my floors. I'm like, Jared, had you just hired someone, didn't take the days off, and made some sales, you could probably hire two people to do your floors. So it's it's sort of like that with every. Again, it took a while. I mean, you you have to. Well, when you get to your marketing automation, the next level of your sales force, you'll remember, oh, right, there are professionals. That's a great tool. Yeah. And the ROI, I mean, in the end, was it, was it, did, was the money well spent? Absolutely. Did it get the team up and running quicker? Absolutely. Were we able to bring in more, you know, three new sales that wouldn't have happened per salesperson a week? Yes. So that was, that was very much the justification when Lisa and I worked on this presentation um, to the powers that be on why we suggested so you that. Can, you know, if I had access to this particular presentation a couple of years ago, it would have been very, very Well, you see, you were an early adopter, though. Early adopters often, often, you know, have to lay the groundwork for us to learn from your successes, so. Well, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's true, though. I mean, the early adopters are always the ones who get to do the first stumbles. Um, configuration and customization. Um, very simple. You want to figure out, you know, your data swap plan, your fields, what, how you want to define your uh, customers um, in your in their profiles, you know, we did a lot of prototype reviews too, where we did a lot of um, user testing. Very, very important. Yeah, I think we did probably two, at least two or three reviews and changes to say, oh, is this how you like it? Actually, no, I want it on this left side, or I want it hidden a little further and, down. And, or, and under, I'm, I'm covering, you know, like what we didn't, we hadn't been able to do before too, and the salespeople, you know, they were really great because we hadn't heard some of it, but they were like, well, it would be really helpful, and I would use it this way, and it just opened our eyes too to more potentials yep. there too. Yep, and streamlining, definitely streamlining how they can access their customers' information. Um, data integration, data import, deployment. It's a man over there in the corner, Mr. Barry. Um, you know, we we really could customize it. Getting we we did we did something different, and I think this may for those of you who are at the beginning. Um, of it. We first took a small amount of contacts and sort of the VIPs and my salespeople and our VIPs, about a thousand, just to sort of feel it out, see how it, um, how we could all work with it. Only, what, probably two and a half months ago, 
did we jump dump in all of our 24 month actives into Salesforce. So we didn't want to throw in too much data in the beginning and too many, too many contacts, accounts, etc. until we were really, really sure that we liked the way it was set up. So yeah. and that we were going to use it correctly. Because I think we started out too once we had the you know the thousand VIPs in there. And then as I started working in and adding in new names, we we started out thinking this is how we were gonna handle names and where we wanted them and buckets for leads and but the leads were actually existing customers and so then when we were looking at metrics that didn't really you know so we made a big mistake. It. Yeah. <laughs> we, we learned there too, but and we had to, throughout here too, we changed our lexicon in, internally too for what in the past a lead might have meant and what a lead means now. Um, and I, I see that we'll probably continue to refine that going forward, but I think it, even, you know, it was kind of a blessing in a way that we did a minimal because then we were, we had time when we came to the point where we had dumped in and the, the rain, remaining 24 actives. We had learned a lot in between Always learning. And, oh, sorry. So you're currently pulling in some what we call actives who have paid, not paid actives, you have to start in. We have pulled them in. So you have to yes. yes. That's who we have. And then we do, you know, we do add we can what we can do is if we want to add a new contact and we know they're in multipub already, we just get the multipub number. We put that in, we have a field with with the multipub number there, and then we can see all the buying history, etc. So it's easy to add someone to. And we had, you know, sales is working in there. They have their doing their opportunities and orders and such. Um, but we also have the store online store where people can go, so we can capture first time buyers through the store, which that doesn't automatically connect to Salesforce. Yes, but, yes, it's here. Yes. Good news in the back corner. <laughs> but so we, but we want to make sure that the if the AEs have the Has ordered through the website, has not hit ordered. Or if they're, or if they, I mean, imagine you have a field where they can put in their information because they're interested and they want something else. That then goes into directly into Salesforce, or you're working on that, you're configuring that right now. Where those, those for right now are getting manually imported okay. through. From my understanding, is is from the website, then we get them into Multipub. And then we can take it from there. But I could be wrong, Jay. Yeah, it essentially takes out like a CSV file and then you can put that file in the sales process. Yeah. But that's for sure. Yeah. Do that. Do you have any weekly? Weekly. We do it weekly. We try to get them in by Monday afternoon so that we can say, you know, you thank you for buying last week. You didn't buy through us, you bought through the website. Again, very important, sir. My marching orders are finding new business and building out the business with our core existing customers. Every, all of you guys know add-on sales, very important. And so once once we've got someone who has just bought one thing, it's important to be able to go back and touch them. They didn't know perhaps that they had an account executive who cares a lot about what they're doing. The LinkedIn. Yes. Does that feed into Salesforce so that somebody comes in through LinkedIn and you have their profile, whatever information you have, and they download something Not yet. What we're what we're doing right now is we're actually manually capturing. We have a pretty we have a quite a large LinkedIn group for our, our you know for our clients. And what we're doing is we're capturing the new names every week. People have signed up new, and then through the marketing department, then they feed them into our leads bucket, and then from there we have an automated, you know, at least three to four touch points. You know, thank you for signing up for LinkedIn. Coming back in two weeks, hey, did you have any questions about LinkedIn? Did you like that free publication we sent you? And that, that all goes through Salesforce and templates, and I'm happy to show you all. Um, so it feels like the line of demarcation we're at now is that, because we still have 
20,000 marketing meetings in multi-cloud is what we that we consider the top class. There aren't anywhere near Salesforce. So and this is kind of a loose definition, but at this point, our best leads, even if they're not qualified, but a LinkedIn name, I think we've managed to sort of like create a short list of our best lead sources, our best buckets, and those go straight into yeah. Salesforce. And so it's actually kind of working in reverse as it is in multi-cloud. So they're saying, yes, we're ready to get these leads, which then they go back to multi-cloud. So it's, it's kind of a double concurrent system. Mm -hmm. that I would agree, yeah. And within, within Salesforce, the AEs, um, once the name's in there, they can look them up. They're on LinkedIn so that they can see their history there, even though they're profiled there, so. So then and my question leads to then the opportunity. How do you characterize an opportunity? You have so many products, right? And somebody, so can you speak to that a little bit? That's not an opportunity. That's an opportunity to get them into our marketing file. An opportunity, again, is, You've raised your hand and you said you're interested possibly in purchasing something. Right. So then specifically you define the opportunity, uh, the, the parameter of it dollar-wise by what they've said they're interested in. Yes, or what or I... They've done. Or what, or... Mm -hmm. An opportunity is a monetary exchange. And as we've talked about in the other session, the salesman is here, so you're, wanting, you're, you're keeping it very defined to what the exact request was, um, because then you can monetize the very specific target. Yeah, of and what products are. they want, etc. So we, and that that was something that is very important, because then you're going to get you want to get your sales metrics in the end, and you want them to be accurate, and you also don't want to say, oh, I've got this closed opportunity, it didn't happen, I lost this, I lost this, I lost this, because that's not necessarily a real opportunity that you lost. Just like with any qualify, anyone who's in sales, you always know when you finally hit the qualifying. It's sort of like late, 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 late. Oh, they're qualified. They are ready. They've, they're ready to buy, and that's when you can put them as an opportunity. If they want free downloads, if they want a free easing, if they've told you how much they love your beautiful business, you know, evaluation update and comments all the time, they're not necessarily buying. Right. They may be your biggest fan, but they're not spending money. But I mean, you can qualify that in, in a certain number of different ways and by the questions of, you know, do they have me, uh, uh, do they have a budget, do they have time, right? right. You know, all those sorts of things, uh, if they can answer positively, then they can go into the other buckets yep. of, of being more qualified, being sales ready. Um, and we do have that actually in, in one of our, I forget which table, but there is, you know, the description, do you have a budget? Exactly those questions, and we check off, do you have a budget there? It's important to know if you can afford it. Um, phase, the end of the phase, this was winter last year, was sort of the soft launch, um, soft launch user training. And this winter, by the way, goes from December until about March, April, if you're from New England. So, um, and you know, then we did a soft lunch. What was really important was is two things. How did I? How how do you motivate the salespeople to actually put in the opportunities? You don't get paid commission if they're not in there. Simple enough. So they. So during our month of March, we did we did a soft launch, and you know, they I wasn't going to hold it against them. They weren't going to be deducted from their pay. But April 1st, by gum, you better have you better have your questions answered, you better know how to use this, and then you will you know, put your opportunities in there. This is when I question, you know, if you're gonna get your commission. If they're not, it is you get paid only by what is in Salesforce. And so essentially from April on was the you know, hard launch, soft launch was a month, which I would strongly suggest everyone do a soft launch. I would check in almost daily with them, with the whole Salesforce team. We would meet on a weekly basis with any questions, we, teams, etc. So that was phase one. Phase two was the, essentially June this past summer, the simple MP integration, you know, defining what default views we wanted to see in Salesforce. I can I certainly can bring this up, you know, installation configuration, etc. Then we established, the second part was establishing basic workflows. 
which includes you know creating basic communication templates as you know, we were saying sort of our weekly contacts who bought something online creating very simple thank you letter that anyone can pull up a template and say thank you for that send it off within literally seconds done um, and we have that from gosh we must have now 25 30 different templates in there <sighs> getting a little template crazy um, and then those workflows also are day one I got an upload that you had bought something on the website I write you a thank you note I follow up four days later this is all put in there saying did you get my email do you have any questions about what you bought don't hear from you follow up two weeks later one liner again if you have any questions I'm always here for you eight weeks later let me send you do you know about our free resources here you go now, do you know about our blogs now, another eight weeks later so it's almost 16 weeks of touch points four to five touch points depending on you know they may say okay you're totally annoying me please <laughs> unsubscribe I have yet to have heard that from anyone so <laughs> you're happy to hear that and all of these mailings are automated it's not they're not automated, automated. They, they, they what you enter 14 days ago and say okay now send a 14 day notice to this person it's not 100 percent yet automated what they do is you can create yourself a task which then gives you a reminder you open it up and I will oh, I should actually bring up Salesforce and it will say there in your tasks you need to send up a follow-up email and if I pull up my Salesforce you're gonna see that I'm really late in some of my tasks. Will you Yes. You can talk to Mr. Perry about that. That's one of his favorite things is to that, think about. Is that functionality in Salesforce or is that it is in Salesforce, absolutely. And I don't think we've pulled the trigger yet because we're not a hundred percent yet confident that we want to automate all of our weekly you know buckets that we get part of it too is you know we still got other systems where you know you don't have everything that's going on with that customer here so you don't want to override right. and so we've got some we're looking to take a next step now to um which we were just going to kind of briefly allude to um with our website we're going to be doing launching uh the next phase in our new website and That's a great question. We don't do it with site licenses like that necessarily. Site licenses are a little bit of a different group in that it's very high touch. And so my salespeople pretty much know if someone has come in from site licenses off, got a new seat or whatever, they get they, they will have direct emails. They're not going to necessarily put them into this you know, two days, four days, one week, two weeks later, because each one of your site licenses is a very special VIP person. Ready? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so kind of, we just kind of previewed, like uh, with Salesforce, it really, with launching this, it really kind of helped show the need that we, we want to learn more about what's going on with our customer and the, the systems that we have in multiple areas. So looking to see how we could centralize that, it's kind of an overall theme to fewer systems is what we're looking for. Um, so we're, now that we've got a good thing for the sales team to track their sales and really, you know, they can stay on top of 
new contacts, would they want to get back to them, add on sales, all of that. Now looking to take the marketing to the next level and there's more, you know, Lexi's asking me for, I want new leads for my team, so how am I going to do that? So I don't want to just hand over leads that are cold um, out of our prospect file that we have. I've got to do something to warm those up, to get them to a point where they're raising their hand again, to pass them back over to the sales team. They'll get really mad if I just send them a bunch of names and I hear about it. So uh, one way we were looking to do that is warming up, putting in a, a, a program for our prospects. And that's something we will admit that we've kind of, we haven't been on the forefront, we have kind of ignored. Um, so now we're going to, i um, excited to say that we're going to actually implement a marketing automation system, which then is going to allow us to take the, the bucket of prospects that we have and do um, some more segmentation on those and really get some targeted efforts going out to groups of people based on what we know about them to try to warm them up to get them over to the sales team. So our... The marketing automation system, as we see it, was going to allow both the, the marketing and sales departments to create and deploy and manage online marketing campaigns, um, to integrate our email marketing and lead generation and lead nurturing, um, to deploy and measure those other results too, because Salesforce has a you know great way of tracking where they are in the process, and if you know they start here and they end up here in the purchase, we can look back and see all the you know the marketing touch points along the way. And again, kind of just overall providing a better view of what's going on with the customer. And that's for anybody within the organization. I mean, I can look in, salespeople, customer service, and, and management too. So can go in and see, we'll have dash, we have some dashboards. We're going to be developing new ones, obviously. Um, but everybody can take a look and see what's going on with um, our customer. Along with that, because of, you know, a lot of a activities going on on the website, being able to actively see what's going on there can help with the sales team when they're um, reaching out to customers to kind of customize their pitch to them based on maybe what they've been downloading on our website, uh, if they've uh, participated in any free webinars, that type of thing. So one of the areas too is looking to integrate our website and what that activity is going on. So we are going to be um, launching a re web design, a redesign. So We've been working on that for a while, and uh, we finally, we have selected a content management system, which is site.com, which is under the Salesforce umbrella too. So it's going to be really nice. Um, one of the benefits there too is centralizing the information um, that we're going, we have one product database that will feed our website. It's the same product database that Lexi's team works out to um, create the opportunities and such. So um, in doing that, just to kind of give a brief, I don't know if you guys want to, I was just kind of kind of go over what we're doing on the website, not marketing automation, but if you're more interested also in more specifically what we've done with Salesforce and the CRM aspect, we can stop there too. So it's kind of what you guys are looking to get out of the session. I'd like to hear about the website. Okay. Um, all right. Just kind of through. So um, website, we've been working on, as I say, on it for quite a while. As you probably kind of guessed, we have had a lot of systems. So part of it was um, we had a person kind of look at all our systems, what we were currently doing, in which system was kind of liking it to a big bowl of spaghetti and pulling the noodles out and kind of putting it together. So we defined all the current systems that we were being used and the limitations to those systems and what we really wish we could do or what we knew need to be solved there. Um, any new requirements of the website? Definitely we want, right now, our website, we don't, there's more we could do in the way of gathering lead generation from there, capturing people that are visiting in a very soft way, not necessarily going to sign up for a free webinar, but doing more with white papers and free downloads and actually in, on individual product pages, not hoping that they go to one section and just peruse everything. So outlining what we wanted with the new website. Um, and we had, along the way, done a lot of research about our internal, what our thoughts were on the website, what could be improved. We actually did some surveys with some customers as well to hear about what their thoughts were on the websites, where their frustrations were, that because type of thing. Because it's very important for you to understand our clients come to our website to access to digital products. So it's not, it's a portal to their products. 
products as well as our marketing. Yes. So, okay, yeah. sorry. We have certain customers that come to us and, and say, we're looking for this, we're looking at that. One thing they'll say is, well, these guys can capture who visits the website, and then we're going to market to those people. But if someone goes to your website, they just go and click on a couple of pages. Do you, do you know, you don't know who they are? We don't know, like, but if they were where we're going with um, the automation, if they, you know, once they do do something that, you know, maybe they download a white paper, right. they're going to be tracked whether, sure. you know, and then we're going to be able to see that view. But you only know who they are once they sign up or something. Right. You know, I mean, you can't just go to a website and then and, and say, okay, now I know who this person is. They click that tricky page. There has to be some point where they give you an email address or Twitter handle or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we've got people, as Lexi said, coming to our website, you know, new viewers, but then we've also got people that are coming to access products, but then our hope is to do, um, do the add-on sales and expose them to other products there. And um, so product definition, define the stakeholders. Um, we have a lot of people, a lot of departments that are involved in our website, from the editorial side to our, you know, our, our databases, financial databases, obviously sales has a lot of feedback on that. Um, marketing, so a lot of people involved in that. Um, review the assumptions and really mind the details from the get-go. And one thing that we've also found too that in discussions, one person may say one thing, and that means something else to to other people sitting at the same table. So it's really making sure that everybody's clear on the definitions of what we're trying to achieve and what that means. Um, and then design the implementation plan. Uh, which is kind of dependent on about how you're going to go about if you're doing this all internal or if you're having an integrator. So um, we started down the path where we were looking to do more of it internally. And um, as we learn more and more, we've decided to go outside and see what other options were available. And happy to say that we have recently selected our vendor. Um, but in that process, we gathered some proposals so we could compare you know, what one was offering. And also, too, a lot of it had to do with the uptime and how they were going to handle getting all of our systems, current systems, into one. Um, we needed definite help there. Um, yeah, okay. So, um, and then on the same part, we were doing the marketing automation side in addition to the website. So we were starting that too, but it was more like, okay, what would we want to do uh, with the marketing automation? What, with looking at our prospect files, um, having new ways to handle some of our free easing distributions that we can do through the marketing automation and how would that also integrate with our CRM was a big one um, on that. So, and that is all, this is all at the very, work, we're at the very learning, we're having our kickoff meetings next week. So there's gonna be a lot that we're gonna learn by this time next year. Um, and hopefully you will see a new website and, and a lot more. Lexi will come back with a lot of reports on new lead generation and such success there. I think one important point that I want to make here is that we decided to stay with a homogenous platform. We decided to stay with Salesforce, use the tools, the proven tools that implement with that system, because we didn't want any surprises. And they're going to be continuously updating, enhancing, etc., those tools that are native to their platform. moment about their, to utilize their prospecting and the lead generation, what is that, data.com? Data.com, data. right, yeah. Okay. I thought it, when we did, we looked at it, we had, we had thought about it. It's a little bit expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, and Salesforce can be expensive um, in the sense that you can have add-ons and add-ons and, <laughs> hey, add-on sales. And um, I, I had been given sort of an unofficial number, and I like to stay within the boundaries of the unofficial number, so I Lower and lower. Um, there are I mean, some. You clearly generate a significant amount of your own leads already, and so I can see where that's the, the determining factor. Why don't we do what we've already had? We could have done data.com. We could have also bought a Hooper's license. I don't know if you guys all remember Hooper's when the good old days were free. <laughs> or that little module, now it's not free at all. And um, I found, you know, if you're a little bit savvy, you can find most of this information. Zoom info has information. There's also one called uh, Inside View, yep. uh, which we, we switched the groups to Inside View, and uh, it's an app in the database that we, we think it's a little magical more robust. Uh, our, sales, like our sales guys like it a lot. Inside View, yeah. okay, good to know. And it, and it, and it you know, fits right into the Salesforce page, and you can click a button and it'll sync the information that Inside View has, and 
doing a lot, one reason we also decided not to go with Reverse or data.com was most of, most of our clients and in our core market, we know. And we've got them in our marketing file. What we're looking for was international, especially in none of these have contracts on that level that we would have been willing to pay for. Any other questions? Feel free to, oh, yeah. Do you have any, I don't know if you all have this lead or not, have you done anything with uh, contracts, managing contracts through? Yeah, that's interesting. You you ask. We manage proposals. We don't necessarily have longer contracts unless it becomes sort of like a licensing discussion, and that those are really more one-off, sort of like the site licenses. These are these are sort of a different beast than your sort of daily regular. You can do contracts. There are there are apps for the contracts in there. I know. I know we were talking about this yesterday that, uh, gosh, I forget who it was. Was it you guys using DocuSign, Nancy? Yeah. Um, someone who was also far along with the Salesforce was using this thing called DocuSign, which is sort of automatic document signature. Um, it's also native to Salesforce. It's a, separate, it's a small little San Francisco company, too. And the person was saying that their salespeople are like, Completely in love with it because it I turns it's around the I think it's Yeah, that that it, that that it goes quicker and that they get their contract signed. Whether they could have had any measurable metrics yet, I think it was early on. But. Thanks, Ed. Yeah. <laughs>